this next one in our Julio series. We're going to be investigating a game between Hikaru Nakamura, who needs absolutely no introduction to modern days, one of the top streamers for chess and has done an amazing job in growing chess and the community and culture. Respect the effort that he puts in as a streamer against Julio in the 2007 U.S. Championship in Stillwater, Oklahoma. Now, this gets back to that preparation thing. The Ponziani is not an opening you see every day. I would classify it as something with some surprise value. And there's multiple lines with the, the Ponziani, but you know, Julio didn't hesitate. He comes to fight, and he chooses one of the most aggressive continuations here with the immediate F5. And from the entire time that Nakamura has been playing chess, he has always been just dangerous tactically, very gifted, and uh, not afraid to play some of these offshoot openings like the Ponziani. So after F5, D4, Knight takes E5, and I, if I had this position with hindsight, a decade, an engine, and modern practice on my side, instead of knight f6 that was played in the game, I would play queen f6, and we get a very interesting line where there's some dancing going on here, queen f7, and h5. And this has been reached only once in tournament play, but I find this... It, th this is the exact type of position you're looking for if you're trying to win with black. I mean, it's fun for both sides, though. Very interesting play. And I just like the, the jockeying of the queen early to utilize that open F file and stay safe on F7. In the main game, we've got knight F6, bishop B5, bishop D6. And black's pieces are a bit awkward. Here, white could take a pretty substantial advantage if he goes with knight g4. And here, after castles, castles, I believe one of the engine's top moves is essentially admitting you're wrong, placing the bishop on d6, and going back to e7 so the pawn can move. So I feel like knight g4's got to be the move somewhere in here in order to kind of punish the developmental choice of bishop d6. In the main game, though, knight c4 was played, and that's helping black fix his issue versus saddling him with it. So bishop e7, and after this next move, bishop a4, black is going to be pretty clearly in the driver's seat for the rest of the game. Now, castles is the more flexible move, followed by knight e3, black finally gets in d5, untombing the bishop on c8. a6, do you want to trade off your bishop in the open position? No, I respect that. Bishop goes back to the better square, supporting our center. And f3, white gets the natural break to hit that e4 pawn. And we got a roughly balanced position. This and look, looking at games in the database, this, this knight e3 thing is something you, you often see in these types of positions as the knight needs to get out of, way, out of the way and get anchored on a reasonable square. Bishop a4, on the other hand, led to d5, followed by castles, and we go for the imbalance here. And I think when this position was committed to, it was easy to miss this follow-up here because it seems like by move 13, White's really gotten what he wanted to out of the opening. He's traded some extra time, and he's got a pawn in hand. So he just needs to trade down to win. You probably need one more move here, like bishop g5, and maybe follow up with something like f3, and you're just good to go. But the problem is, black has some aggressive resources here. we got to start it off with knight g4. Let's get nasty. h3. So, what would you do here with black? 
Hopefully if you're a pause your video type of guy, you took the moment there, to try to figure things out. And we got two choices, but one of them I like more. Julio in the main game played E3. Engine's a big fan of knight takes F2. Full credit for either move. Takes, takes, takes. Because this, this is hard to see. If you found this, you're definitely better than me. Because I was in disbelief looking at this. But the problem is, is that White can't coordinate his completely undeveloped and untouched pieces on the queen side. So I keep tension. Trying to get some development. All right, bishop g4. Now rook f8 is a big threat. Got to stop that. And I love this stutter step. Okay, I want to get in. You want to let me in? Okay, I'm going to insist I'm getting in. G5, you're moving the bishop, and now rook f8. So this type's of knight, knight takes f2 line, it, it can be difficult to calculate in a practical game. And honestly, once I saw the position on queen h5, I would have thought that white's going to be safe. But even moves like queen g2 are met by bishop g4, followed by bishop f3 or rook f8. Black's pieces have complete harmony. That's what makes him so, so dangerous here. But in the main game, e3 was played. Takes, takes, takes. How can we keep the attack going? Absolutely critical move for black. So another pause your video moment. What do you do? All right, a lot of people probably wanted to play queen takes e3. But it's hard to find a follow-up move after queen takes e3, king h2. Bishop takes h3, on the other hand, full marks if you got that one. So the question is, what happens if white takes? Well, let's get nasty. Check. Takes. Rook f8. And good luck finding a good move for white here, as, again... The lack of development from white's queenside pieces, it's two versus one, and your king's wide open. That's a loss. In the main game, rook f3 was played. Takes, takes. So a great pause your video question again here is, what happens if white grabs the bishop on g4? Black to play him win. Hopefully pause your video to figure it out. Queen takes e3. Check. Check. And queen c1 with the idea, again, when you're not using your pieces, they're not in the game, and white's going to suffer some serious material loss as the knight can't move due to dropping the rook, and we have the big threat of taking on b2 where the rook's lost anyway. So coming back, queen e1 was played to cover the e3 pawn. And we've got to keep the attack going. All the pieces are in harmony. Rook f6. Rook g6. Queen e6. <laughs> Slow, steady improvement. Best attempt for white here. White can get back to equality with absolute best play, but it's hard. And I'm imagining they were in time trouble by this point. Knight f3, willingly giving up the e-pawn, but you reach this, you got an equal position. So this was white's best bet, but probably in mutual time trouble, Nakamura decided to roll the dice and keep tension in the position. And he's always been an extremely uncompromising player. That's why I've always been a big fan. And you know, I love the fact that uh, in the tenure of the Miami champions, both of these guys played on the team. After bishop h3, g3. Well, the only thing separating that king from doom is the g-pawn, so h5, looking to keep chipping away. Rook g4. There's that key move, h4. It's the reason we move the h-pawn. Takes. Check. Check. Check, check, check. And you know it's a it's a bad day with all these checks. Queen c8, and after king h7, 
No more checks. Well, good ones anyway. No more hope for White. And White decides to throw in the towel there. You know, it's not that the Ponziani's a bad opening. There were mutual mistakes on both sides in this game. But that's the thing when someone plays an opening that is for surprise value. It's you against them. And your preparation may not always be the best. I think these games are always the most interesting. When you see two guys just go through a line and play 30, 40 moves of prep, and then this is where both of our engines agreed that, you know, it's roughly equal, and they play a few more moves and agree to a draw. These types of surprise value games, when one or both players are rolling the dice, those are far more interesting to evaluate. And like I said before, Nakamura is fantastic from his uncompromising style of play. And Julio is fantastic because when he gets hit by these surprise weapons, he has one prepared of his own.